Uh, thank you, Ashok, and thank you, everybody, uh, for being here. It's really a great pleasure to uh, give a talk in this seminar series. Okay, so my name is Rastko Snapnek, and I'm at the University of Dundee in Scotland. I'm, embedded, I'm a physicist who is embedded in a school of uh, life sciences. And today I'm going to tell you uh, a bit about uh, our work on trying to understand uh, how cell-level processes uh, coordinate uh, to form morphogenic flows, in particular, uh, working on the problems uh, on the on the chick embryo as the as the system. Okay, so let me first thank the people who were uh, directly involved uh, in various aspects of this work. Uh, so most of the experiments that I'm going to show, actually all of the experiments I'm going to show you today, were done uh, in the lab of Kay Sweyer, who is a developmental biologist and my colleague. A lot of the early stage modeling uh, was done in collaboration with Selke Henkes, who is now at the Leiden University. Uh, one of the key models that I'm going to present in here of dissipation was done in collaboration uh, with Andrei Koshmel at Princeton and his uh, PhD student, C.G. Tong. And the, a lot of the works that, the, a lot of the modeling, which I'm going to show today, was done uh, by two postdocs, Jan Rosman and uh, Chatania, uh, in collaboration with uh, Julia Yeomans at Oxford as a part of a Physics of Life grant funded by the uh, British uh, EPSRC uh, Council. Okay, so let me get... Uh, started. So what you what you're gonna see in here is an in vivo is in vivo in vivo imaging of the first thirty or so hours of life of a chicken. Uh, so the movie starts roughly several hours after the the leg is a uh, the uh, egg is laid. Uh, the, the embryo is at that stage, let's say sixty to hundred thousand cells, three to four millimeters uh, across, and the movie is gonna go for the roughly is gonna cover roughly twenty hours. Uh, after after that. Uh, so what we're going to see in here is a large scale motion in the tissue. It's a very, very dynamic system and a formation of a groove-like structure, uh, which is called primitive streak. So that's the uh, hallmark of gastrulation in avian, in avian embryos, in, uh, in bird embryos. Uh, and this is the biologist, uh, the famous uh, developmental biologist, Wolpert, says that this is the most important event in your life, right? So this is uh, the event uh, which creates a uh, three, uh, which where the embryo uh, undergoes the transition into, differentiates its three, uh, three basic layers, endoderm, ectoderm, and mesoderm, which then actually set up the body plan and lead to the fertile development uh, of, the, of the organism. Uh, so let's see how this process looks uh, from the top. So these are again movies uh, taken in the lab of case layer uh, using light sheet microscopy. Uh, so to give you uh, a feel, uh, this is approximately seven and a half thousand pixels by this not in that by like four four and a half thousand pixels or so. Uh, images are taken uh, once every three minutes for around three thousand three thousand steps or like twenty or so uh, hours. Uh, these lines, vertical lines in here are just bleached. Uh, so that we can see how the uh, embryo, how the how the flows uh, look like, and please ignore uh, the squares. Right? So let's see how this looks like from the top. Uh, so we see nothing much happening, and then suddenly cells start moving, and we see a kind of motion, which I'm going to characterize in a bit, a little bit later, and the formation of a bright uh, structure in the center, which corresponds to the primitive streak, which I've uh, showed in the previous uh, in the previous slide. So this uh, dot in here, this is the anterior, the head. This is where the head is going to be. And this is the posterior. This is where the tail somites will develop, and eventually you will get uh, a spine. So one can then actually uh, track uh, the motion of different uh, different uh, regions of the embryo uh, and identify a sickle shaped, a crescent moon shaped uh, region of the cells that undergo. Uh, the large deformation. And what I'm going to show in here in blue is going to show contractions and in red expansions. So if you play the movie, uh, we see there is actually a significant uh, deformation of the of the embryo, and in particular of the embryonic tissue, right? And the in particular uh, of this uh, sickle-shaped region, uh, which contracts in the vertical direction, so orthogonal to the AP axis and extends in the in the apical uh, uh, in the anterior posterior axis forming uh, this group structure so now the question is uh, can we understand 
uh, the mechanics of these these processes. And of course, there are many, many people who have been working on this. A lot of work has been done uh, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, continuum modeling, but I'm going to use a cell-based modeling uh, in this talk. But before I get to the to the point of modeling, let me tell you a little bit about the geometry of the, of the system. So uh, embryos, so embryos sit on the top of the uh, of the yolk, and as I said, when the egg is laid, it's a uh, it's a roughly a, a disc-like structure, three to four millimeters across. And what is for the, for this talk, what is important? There are two regions. Uh, the what is called the area opaca, that's the uh, opaque region of several cells thickness, which is connected to the vitellin membrane. Vitellin membrane is the membrane which sits around the yolk and gives the hardness, uh, gives the keeps the keeps the yolk altogether. And the what is called the epiblast, the uh, what is shown in uh, here in purple, uh, is is the uh, that's the that's the embryonic that's the active embryonic uh, region uh, which undergoes these uh, morphogenic uh, motions. Uh, and the sickle-shaped region here is in the posterior side, and this region is characterized uh, by a lot of wind signaling and the expression of one of the uh, growth factors, which uh, essentially do, those trigger the what is called the epithelial to mesochymal uh, transition. The the most important thing for this talk uh, is that the uh, at these early stages uh, the embryo is not supported by a substrate, so the epiblast. Uh, is essentially sitting on a gooey-like structure, uh, which is sitting between the yolk and the and the and the epiblast. And as the cells are uh, cells are slowly generating the uh, so slowly generating the the substrate uh, as they as they move and develop. But in these early stages, this is not supported by by any kind of uh, solid structure. Okay, so uh, how does it uh, all look like schematically? The formation of the of the chick embryos. I'm going to play the movie on the left now. Rotate it. Uh, and here on the right, I'm going to show cartoons. Uh, so these contractions start in this uh, sickle-shaped uh, region. Uh, it shrinks in the horizontal direction, so perpendicular to the anterior-posterior axis, uh, and starts pushing in the vertical direction, extending in the uh, AP direction. And this is followed uh, by a large-scale motion of the tissue as indicated here by these uh, green arrows uh, of the of the of the flows, so cells are moving huge distances, three or four, two or three millimeters uh, from where they uh, where they started, right? and this this seems to be quite reproducible along uh, across uh, multiple experiments. So essentially, the idea in here is we want to try uh, to understand how can one uh, get into the situation of uh, this thing contracting uh, in the horizontal direction and then being expanding in the vertical direction uh, with the flows uh, that uh, look like what we see in the experiments. And uh, to spoil the, the punchline, I'm not going to answer this question uh, this to, completely today, uh, but I'm going to give some hints uh, into the uh, various ways how one can model this and what are the very what are the important aspects uh, in trying to understand this. Okay, so, uh, in, but uh, an important uh, phenomenon which we, uh, an important ingredient in all of this is that there is actually quite a bit of anisotropy in the system. So if you go at the cell level uh, resolution, and these are, these were these, these uh, squares, which I told you to ignore. If you, if you look at this, at the uh, cell level resolution, you see there is actually quite a bit of anisotropy uh, in terms of the mechanical stresses, which we don't really directly measure, but we infer them uh, by looking into the uh, distribution of myosin in the cells. Uh, which forms these cable-like structures, and then it's the assumption is that myosin is a motor which is uh, creating tensions in the in the cell, and then these uh, that the uh, myosin cables are responsible for the generation of stresses that are anisotropic, and uh, one can also uh, track the intercalation events, which are the uh, cell exchanges, cell neighbor exchanges events, and these are also highly anisotropic uh, and going um, in the uh, cells are exchanging neighbors in the perpendicular to the to the AP axis and then extended uh, orthogonal uh, to it. Okay, so how do we go about uh, modeling something like this? Well, our uh, tool of choice is the vertex model. So we see at the cell level scale, as I said, many people work on this uh, using uh, continue modeling. Uh, we decided to sit at the cell level scale. Uh, so this is a cartoon of an epithelium. The epiblast is, is an example of an epithelial uh, sheet. Uh, so epithelial cells are complicated cells, but uh, for the for the purposes of of this level of modeling, 
uh, we only focus on the reticle side on the top side uh, which looks like a polygonal uh, tiling of a plane and then one can construct uh, a what is called the vertex model uh, where cells are represented as polygons uh, two cells share an edge and uh, three or more cells uh, meet at the vertex and then the vertex becomes the degree uh, of freedom one can then assign uh, and uh, one can assign areas perimeters uh, and line tensions to to these objects and corresponding uh, uh, moduli and write an elastic energy which looks like uh, something like this there are three terms the three terms the first term is the penalty of changing the area of a cell which corresponds to the fact uh, that the cell is uh, the cell if the other cells are keeping uh, keeping their volume fixed so if you want to keep a volume fixed and by changing change the height you're going to have a penalty of changing the uh, the area very loosely speaking right there is a penalty of changing uh, the perimeter and then there is a penalty of uh, changing the uh, junction uh, junction length i'm going to write rewrite this slightly differently uh, in a second then let me just briefly mention that this model has uh, has been around for for more than 40 years now but it's been re reinvented uh, several times over the uh, past four decades right okay so how does one uh, make this dynamic so the simplest the simplest possible uh, thing is to essentially invoke uh, the observe that the cells are moving very, very slowly, several micros a minute, right? Uh, so all inertial effects are uh, negligible. So one then essentially goes, works into the overdamp limit when there is a balance uh, between the friction and the elastic forces that are in this particular case, uh, just a gradient of the energy function that I showed you in the previous slide with respect to the position uh, of the vertex. Uh, I'll already anticipate that I will mess with this term on the left a little bit, and that's going to be very important. But now we know that the cells are active systems, so how do we add activity? Well, we do it ad hoc. Um, but so what are the possible sources of activity? Uh, well, uh, cells migrate, right? So they push against each other. Uh, they exchange neighbors. So they also can ingress or, or be extruded, and they also can divide, right? They also change, change their shape. They also signal with each other, and they are affected by the boundaries, boundary, uh, boundary effects. So uh, all these effects are very loosely speaking embedded in a heuristic equation such as this one, where we uh, augment the law, which I showed up here, uh, by adding uh, a phenomenological uh, active force. And, and essentially now trick of the trade is coming up uh, with a, a good model uh, for activity. And, I'm, and this can be quite complicated, actually. Okay, so that's, that's essentially the, uh, the uh, idea. Okay, so uh, let's actually see how we can go about adding activity. Uh, so first, I'm going to go back and uh, uh, remind you that I mentioned that actually there is quite a bit of anisotropy uh, in the uh, in this there are anisotropic stasis in the system, and uh, these anisotropic stasis have tend to have a pneumatic symmetry, right? Meaning, so they uh, they have a preferred axis, but there is no hetel uh, there is a hetel symmetry, uh, and that's been actually observed uh, quite a bit in uh, cell monolayers. Uh, uh, these are on the left are experiments on myoblasts, which are precursor cells for uh, for muscle cells. Then uh, the the two on the the middle and the right are also called MDCK cells, which are epithelial cells, kidney cells uh, derived from uh, from a dog. Right. So let me quickly remind you uh, what pneumatics are. So pneumatics are uh, uh, materials made out of elongated objects. Uh, and uh, what is particularly important in in here is that they are, they allow uh, for uh, so-called topological excitations uh, that usually have a topological to, uh, fractional topological topological charge, which is in this case uh, one half plus or minus one half. And unfortunately, I don't have enough time to go into the details, uh, but that's kind of quite standard. Uh, uh, probably everybody should be familiar uh, in this audience. Uh, it's quite standard thing, which is uh, known in uh, physics of liquid crystals. Then one can actually write a uh, or the parameter, which uh, which is a tensor, which looks like uh, something like this, and then postulate that the uh, this type of uh, pneumatic order uh, causes active stresses uh, that are proportional to this uh, Q tensor with some proportionality uh, constant. Unfortunately, in, in in literature there is disagreement about uh, the sign, and I'm going to work in the sign where this uh, zeta negative means a contractile, and uh, zeta positive means extensile, and this indicates what, what kind of flows uh, these type of uh, interactions are uh, causing. Right? Okay, so uh, let me then now try to incorporate uh, such an effect into the vertex model. 
I'm going to rewrite this slightly differently. I'm going to combine these two terms into a, a term such as this one so that I have a symmetric uh, symmetric form. So the penalty of changing area and penalty of changing perimeter with respect to some uh, reference values. I'm going to make all of this non-dimensional. And the important parameter in here is showing red, the ratio of the preferred perimeter, the square root of, uh, uh, of the preferred area, which then sets up the whether the, the tissue is fluid or not. Uh, and then without going into the into the mathematics, which I'm just going to show in here, I'm going to say what the, the our assumption is here. And I need to emphasize that this model is essentially pulled out of hat, meaning we've just essentially said, let's let's actually try to uh, to to prescribe a certain type of uh, of pneumatic interaction uh, to the cells and see what happens. And what we came up with is we assumed uh, that there is some kind of a readout of the cell shape, which is given by the uh, gyration tensor of that of of that the principal uh, the 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 uh, the eigenvector which corresponds to the larger of the two uh, principal uh, uh, to the to two eigenvalues of this of this tensor gives us directionality of the of the shape and then the, then the junctions that are aligned roughly speaking with that uh, with direction of the of preferred direction of the, of the cell have a uh, larger tension compared to those that are orthogonal uh, and then we put this into the vertex model and do simulations. Uh, by tuning the activity, which is the zeta parameter, and P0, uh, which, let me remind you, that's the parameter which controls whether the tissue is in the solid phase or in a fluid phase. So low values of P0, below 3.8 or so, uh, tissue is solid, and above that value, tissue is fluid. And what we see is quite interesting uh, motion. And I'll point your attention to the to these objects in here, such as such as this one, for example, right? and if one looks closer to them, them such as this guy in here, right? uh, one sees uh, that this is actually a uh, topological defect in the pneumatic order, but it has a plus one charge, and uh, this is quite striking because uh, although topologically plus one charges are possible in pneumatic, they are usually very unlikely because they fall apart into two uh, one halves. And in this case, they seem to be stable or stable over a long, long period of time. And the reason is uh, that the system, that the cells, that the pneumatic in here is essentially a readout of the cell shape, but not, uh, not really a degree of freedom, right? So the, so the, the uh, cells organize themselves in a such a way that they build this type of rings of tension uh, that kind of like a rubber bands sit around the, the, the defect and kind of prevent it from uh, falling apart. And one can actually see this uh, if one looks into the area of the cells. I have, I apologize, I have no clue what this 0 0.18 on the, on the right is. Uh, so one actually sees that there is actually change of the, of the shape and the compression of the, of the cells uh, around, uh, around the, the defect. Right. Okay, but as I said, this was, this was all kind of rather ad hoc where we've, where we've pulled out uh, this, this model out of the head. So one can actually uh, do a little bit uh, more, and we've uh, invoked uh, two very good uh, works uh, of uh, German and French groups. Uh, and the idea is is very simple: is you now prescribe some kind of anisotropic stresses uh, on the uh, on the cell, right? And then you use them to calculate the forces on the vertices of that cell. The problem is uh, over is underdetermined, so there are multiple ways you can construct the forces from a given. Given, uh, given, given stress. So in here, we are gonna use the Tlili model, uh, which assumes uh, that the forces are calculated uh, based on the kind of textbook definition of the stresses where you get the tractions on the, or where you get forces on the, on the, on the edges of a region as the uh, stress times the normal vector. And then the, uh, the average force is just the force of the, uh, of the two, uh, the force on the vertex is just the average of the forces on, of the two, uh, two vertices, right? And then we, this model was actually uh, then one can actually introduce uh, the activity uh, in uh, in in such a model by uh, using the same uh, logic with the Q tensors. Where now Q tensor is the readout of the uh, cell shape uh, defined uh, such as this one. So essentially, you just go around the cell and construct the tensor by uh, adding up the unit vectors that that form the uh, that form the cell. And this was analyzed uh, uh, by Matthias Merkel and, and his collaborators. And this this system has a very very interesting uh, phase. Uh, behavior. So what we as uh, very very interesting uh, collective behavior. So what we what we decided we, we decided to ask uh, what happens if we now confine such a system, right? With so so the vertex model plus 
uh, this activity given in terms of these Q tensors and uh, that Lily model of calculating forces into a, a channel. And why we decided to do this? Because it's actually been uh, uh, quite extensively studied. Uh, Nematics in a channel have been quite extensively studied, and it's, it's been shown uh, that if you vary the activity and the and the you, you play activity versus the width of the channel, uh, you get all sorts of phasing from the instability to kind of this bend wavy like uh, like behavior to uh, a vortex like structure to active turbulence. So the question was, what's going to happen? Uh, if you put a vertex model into a channel, and unfortunately, uh, not much happens, meaning cells are kind of dancing around, but there is no uh, coherent flow. But then, as I said, uh, one can actually now uh, play with the left-hand side of the equation of motion. Uh, so the assumption in here was that there is a, some kind of a friction, which is proportional to the velocity of the vertex, which kind of implicitly assumes that there is a substrate against which the vertex is uh, moving, but but these things are not supported by the vertex, so it's much more natural to use kind of more more be more inspired by fluid dynamics and assume that these are viscous stress, viscous dissipation, which is coming into play, uh, and that's the uh, something which Andre and I and and CG came came up with. Uh, uh, the idea uh, was to essentially augment the left hand side of the of uh, the, of the equation. Uh, sorry for yeah. interrupting, but just you have about five minutes. So, uh, okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. So so the so the idea was. Uh, to essentially assume uh, that the uh, that the uh, friction is due to relative motion, relative velocity of the neighboring uh, of the neighboring vertices. So if I want to calculate the friction on on this vertex in here, I need to compare it. I need to compare its velocity to its uh, neighbors. We still leave the uh, leave the, uh, the 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 dry friction. We call dry friction term the the, the, the term with the, with the substrate uh, mainly to for numerical uh, stability reasons, and we keep it very very. Uh, very small, and then we solve uh, this type of set of equations with the right hand side given uh, using the uh, uh, vertex model plus the uh, activity. And if you do this, uh, suddenly things drastically change, and the thing starts flowing. Uh, so you indeed uh, you can now uh, measure the flows, uh, and indeed in the what we call the dry case, the case where you have only substrate uh, friction with the substrate. Uh, if you calculate the mean square displacement versus time, you have the standard linear diffusive behavior, uh, but you have a ballistic behavior if you change uh, the force or the friction, uh, the, the type of the of the of the of the friction, and you can actually see that by tuning this uh, dry friction, you can stop uh, the flow, uh, and then you can uh, calculate the velocity profiles, uh, and there is a stark difference uh, between the uh, dry case and the uh, and the and the wet case where uh, cells are just dancing. Uh, at uh, around there, uh, they, they're dancing in in uh, uh, they're not really moving coherently uh, versus uh, versus kind of a very nice uh, flow uh, in the channel. And so you can ask yourself why is where is this coming from? Well, actually, it turns out uh, that the velocity velocity correlation between different cells is heavily dependent on the on the friction and of the presence of the of this uh, uh, relative motion of the cells versus uh, uh, friction with the substrate. And if you get rid of the friction with the substrate, you see that cells correlate at their velocity over much larger distances. And now you can ask what happens if I embed such an active system into a passive tissue. We again uh, see the flows. And you can go back to the to the embryo situation where you pre-pattern these guys to have these white guys. Uh, in a in a uh, they have a certain uh, contractility in a in a in this case in the horizontal uh, direction, and you let it play and it does contract and form a primitive streak, and indeed uh, you form uh, vortices to to flow vortices uh, that have been observed uh, experimentally. Now the shape of the streak is still not yet there, so this is still a work in progress. But at least in my opinion, uh, the uh, ingredients, uh, the right ingredients are there. And what is crucial in here is, is the presence of this wet friction. If you do this with the so-called quote-unquote dry friction, uh, this does not, uh, does not happen. Uh, so in summary, I think that the vertex model can tell us quite a bit. It's, it's a very, very nice uh, model. It actually allows uh, very easy and direct extension uh, to include processes such as dissipation and activity. However, there is much more work to be done. Uh, these objects, uh, the embryos fold into the third dimension, so kind of including the third dimension will be very important. That is actually quite some spectacular work out there. Uh, people are doing things like that. 
um, and uh, also kind of uh, uh, there is a very strong assumption in the in the two cells sharing a single junction because cells actually have uh, two membranes that can slide past each other. So there there are some limitations to the model, but I think overall uh, the model is actually quite powerful uh, in in kind of teasing out interesting aspects uh, of or morphogenesis. Uh, thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Rasko. That was a fascinating talk. Uh, folks, uh, thank you. Any, any questions? Uh, I'm clapping on behalf of the audience. Uh, folks, any questions? I had one uh, uh, which I just put in the chat, which is that uh, uh, you the uh, when you when you reconstruct the primitive streak in your in your last slide, uh, you begin from this pre-patterned uh, sort of uh, structure, right? And so I was just wondering, yes. uh, is this is this pre-patterning something that's coming from? Uh, it's it's I think what what you probably talked about right in the beginning, but is it is it coming from what's known? Is this a pre-patterning something that we know that's happening, or and how robust is? is this process or the primitive streak formation to different types of this pre-patterning? That's, 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 that's really an excellent question. So the, the answer to this, we, we don't still, I mean, I'm, I'm not a developmental biologist, but my colleagues tell me that this, we, we, there are some indications what might be happening. And uh, there are some indications that there is actually a, a different uh, cell uh, division rate in the embryonic area, blue, and the extra embryonic area, uh, red. And that somehow triggers uh, signaling at the at the at the edge, mm -hmm. which then uh, triggers uh, these cells in the sickle shape region to express wind, which mm -hmm. then triggers them to go into the EMT transition. Right. So these these cells are first that are gonna undergo the uh, EMT transition, migrate towards the streak, ingress, and then form the mesoderm. But that's, I apologize, that's pretty much as much as I understand of the of the developmental biology aspect. But this is an excellent, excellent question. So the question is, why is it is a sickle shape? And actually, the, 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 it's a really interesting evolutionary. Uh, for, for avian embryos, it's a sickle shaped object. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, for lizards is, is very similar, but it's a ring. Okay. So you can actually, uh, you can actually trace different, uh, different, uh, different species. Uh, of the of the vertebrates, they have a very very similar uh, similar pattern, but the the this this uh, uh, act, so called active region, quote unquote, has slightly different shape. But how it comes about is is, in my understanding, completely known. But but if you if you try the same, like how general is your explanation? If you try the same uh, simulation starting from say a ring, do you get something that looks more like a lizard than than a bird? Uh, we have we have not started we have not tried it in the vertex model, but there is a very nice nice paper with my colleague uh, K. Sveyer, uh and uh, with Mahadevan in in Harvard where they actually did this science. It's a science advances paper last last year, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. where they actually did this and they experimentally managed to uh, to express to so you you can actually take the beads and uh, uh, soak them with with the with the growth factors and then it, it kind of force the. Uh, Force a different shape of the of this of this uh, precursor region in the chick embryo, and you can initiate something which looks like a, like a development of different organisms. 